Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 348. So today we're talking about algorithms, which is, uh, I imagine, a word that you have heard a lot in computer science. It's Sometimes it can be treated as sort of a buzzword. People are talking about algorithms this and algorithms that and all that kind of stuff. And today what we're really going to do is uh, explain what exactly an algorithm is. So really, at the core of, well, let's talk about functions for a little bit. Um, at the core of functions, basically functions are structures that transform inputs into outputs. Uh, with, of course, the restrictions that <clears throat> every input in the domain has at least one transformation under that function. And an algorithm really isn't anything different. It's just a, it is still a function. It still takes input values and gives out output values. However, what an algorithm, what sets, what makes an algorithm special is that we define what an algorithm does by describing a procedure that transforms inputs to outputs. So rather doing something like, you know, f from the real numbers to the real numbers such that f of x equals z to the x or something like that, what we're doing is we're actually saying these are the steps that our function takes in order to take an input value or values and give us out an output value. So that's basically at the core of what's going on is that algorithms are just functions. They're just really fancy, fancy functions. So let's talk about an actual definition for an algorithm. So a algorithm is an algorithm is a series of precise instructions that describe how a function transforms inputs to outputs. And sort of like with our definition of proofs and stuff like that, this is a little bit of a vague definition. So of course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into more of what this actually means, what it means to have a, um, what it means to be a, a series of precise instructions and sort of that, all that kind of stuff. But that's really what it is at the core is it's describing a function's computation through a series of instructions. And the nice thing about algorithms, which is uh, something that we'll get into a little bit in this class, but which is something that you will see a lot in CSC 349 if you end up taking that, is that we can actually use algorithms as a scaffold for building code because once we have a series of precise instructions, then it becomes pretty trivial to turn those instructions into code. So let's talk about an example problem really quick. Let's say we're looking at the max element problem. And really what the max element problem does is it tries to find the maximum element in a sequence. So a sequence given, you know, you have some sort of n tuple or something like that, and you're trying to find the largest value inside of that n tuple. So if I were to talk about how the max element problem works, you know, maybe I could say something like this. And th this should be something that you remember from classes like 202 or 203, where if we're trying to find the maximum element of a sequence, what we can do is we can first, we can assume the first element is largest. Then what we can do is we can say, uh, we'll go through all other elements. What we can do then is we can uh, compare each element to the largest element and then basically if current element is larger than largest element or than largest so far 
make the current element largest. So this is a description of how to solve the max element problem. It's not a very good one. And I, I, I'd say that even it's a, I, I put heavy quotation marks around the fact that this is a description because it's not very well defined. If I wanted to give this to you and say, okay, write a function to solve the max element problem based off of just these steps, it would take some doing. You would have to do some conversion basically to um, try to parse what exactly I'm saying with these, uh, with these steps, with these instructions, and then figure out, well, like these instructions aren't really super well formatted to actually describe the procedure because I have this sort of pseudo for loop kind of thing. I have a pseudo like if statement kind of thing. And it's a little bit out of order because we're saying go through all of the other elements and then for each element, you know, it's kind of weird. So I would say that this is very ambiguous, a very ambiguous definition of the max element function, a very ambiguous procedure, a way to describe the procedure of a solution for max element. So let's talk about things that properties that an algorithm must have. And we'll come back to the max element problem. We'll talk about what a good algorithm for this would be, but let's talk about what makes a good algorithm. So let's see, things an algorithm must do. These are the bare minimum for any algorithm. Things an algorithm must do. An algorithm must take input values from a specified set which is in fact our domain and produce output values representing values from a specific set. From a specific set. Which we could think of as the codomain. So this bullet point right here Basically, it's another way of restating part of the definition of a function, that a function takes inputs from a domain and maps those inputs to outputs in a codomain. Um, so really, this part right here, it's just, it comes from the fact that an algorithm is a way of defining a function. So in order for an algorithm to be correct, it must 100%, you know, define a function like this. So if it can't even do this, if it can't even take elements from a domain and back them to a codomain, then it certainly cannot be a function, so it would not count as a valid algorithm. Uh, the next thing that I must do is be definite. And basically, you can think of this as just being a fancy way of saying it must have precisely defined steps. So for example, these steps all here are not precisely defined. Um, Actually, none of these steps are precisely defined. If you, it, you can make the argument that none of them are, and I would say that's probably correct. But saying go through all the other elements, compare each element to the largest element. If current element is larger than the largest so far, make the current element largest. None of those are precisely defined. Like, there's all that ambiguity and like, kind of what's going on there. You have to spend all that time thinking about it. And in more complicated problems, this amb ambiguity issue would become a lot worse. So uh, in just a little bit, I'll talk about what it means for an algorithm to be definite uh, and talk about precisely defined steps. Um, the next thing that it must do is it must be correct, which seems obvious. But um, what it means to be correct is that for each input, it, the algorithm should actually produce the output that we are looking for for the problem. So for example, for max element, an algorithm that solves max element should give us the maximum element of a sequence. It should not give us anything other than the maximum element of the sequence. So 
that is what that would mean for this algorithm to be correct. And we'll talk plenty about what it means for an algorithm to be correct. So don't worry about that one. It must be finite. And what that means is that it must be able to produce output in a finite number of steps. Uh, the simplest way you can think about that is it must not infinite loop or anything like that. Um, and you'll talk about more or you'll talk more about how you'll know when an algorithm is finite or something like that in, uh, or how you can prove that an algorithm is finite in classes like 349. But basically, you must be able to produce the output in a finite number of steps, always, for every single possible input. And then the last thing that it must do is an algorithm must be general. Uh, We've talked a lot about generality in this class. We've talked a lot about arbitrary values and the same thing's going to apply for algorithms is that we're, we're going, still going to be using a lot of arbitrary values. Um, what it means for it to be general is that it must apply to all inputs or it must apply to all elements from the domain. And again, this is actually another condition that sort of comes from the fact that an algorithm, algorithm describes a function that a function has a definition for every input value in the domain. So for an algorithm to correctly define a function, it must be able to work for every input value from the domain. So this point right here, be general, as well as take inputs from a domain and output values into a codomain, these two both come directly from the fact that it is a function. All right, so now, just like when we talked about proofs for the first time in this class, I'm going to differentiate things that an algorithm must do but with uh, things that a good algorithm should do. So these are in addition to the things that an algorithm must do. So a good algorithm should define input and output in detail. What does the input of the, of the algorithm look like? What does the output look like? What, what properties does the input have and what properties does the output have? The more detail you can go into, the easier it will be for someone reading your algorithm to um, basically to be able to understand what's going on. And the reason why it's so important for a reader to look at the algorithm is not only understand why it works, but also to potentially use your algorithm to build code off of if they want to actually code the solutions to the uh, problems that you have defined using your algorithm. So good readability is very important. Another big thing is do not use programming language specific details. Uh, the reason why is we want algorithms to be relatively programming language agnostic. And we want to do this because an algorithm should be able to be easily translatable to another programming language. So if you try to sort of write your algorithm out in C, then imagine trying to translate it to something like Python, or maybe Python's a little easier, but something like Java, also maybe a little easier. Something like Rust would be a nightmare to have to translate from C into Rust, or even worse if your uh, algorithm is in a language like Rust. Oh my god, that would be horrible. <laughs> so really what you want to do is you want to you don't want to use programming language specific details. So things like that include uh, memory allocation, data structures, all of that kind of stuff. Don't worry about any of that, um, which I, I would like to think is a good thing that you don't have to worry about things like memory allocation, uh, things like error handling, libraries, all that kind of stuff you don't have to worry about. The big thing you do not have to worry about is input validation you are actually allowed to assume all inputs are correct. The reason why is an algorithm lets you define a procedure. So it says, okay, if the input looks like the form that we have specified, basically, if the input, say, to max element is a sequence of, uh, in this case, it's going to be a sequence of finite integers, which we'll talk about that uh, when I actually give an algorithm for that problem. But basically, it's if the input is a sequence of finite uh, a finite sequence of integers, then this is the procedure that the algorithm will use in order to calculate the maximum element. 
then we can do stuff like, okay, well, we don't have to worry about if we get an infinite sequence, or we don't have to worry about a uh, sequence in the complex plane, or something like that. Like, that kind of stuff. We don't have to worry about any of that wild stuff. The last thing a good algorithm should be is human readable. Is uh, You want a human to be able to read the algorithm. You don't care about what a computer thinks about your algorithm because a computer will never actually see your algorithm. It will see, a computer will only see the work that a human does converting an algorithm into programming language. So your algorithm should be as easy as possible to understand so that another human or even yourself can uh, convert it into a series of, uh, basically convert it into code so that your algorithm can actually be applied in real life scenarios. So the way we're going to talk about algorithms in order to accomplish all of those goals is using something called pseudocode. It's not quite code. It's sort of code, like, but it's not. What it is, it's, it's a mathematical language that's used to basically describe precise, uh, precise operations. So I have right here that is programming language agnostic, which means that it doesn't really look like any particular programming language. Maybe it looks a little bit like Python, but there are still plenty of differences, and that's only because Python is uh, a relatively nice language in terms of programming stuff. But the big thing about pseudocode is that it uses mathematical terminology to define precise instructions, and that it doesn't use programming language specific syntax. So what I'm going to present is I'm going to present a way, a sort of a style of pseudocode that is basically the style that I've developed over the years of being in this program. Um, really, you'll see a lot of different pseudocode styles as you go along. Um, if you search up uh, algorithms on the internet, you might see much different pseudocode. Maybe, maybe not much different, but slightly different pseudocode. Uh, my pseudocode happens to look like a lot of the pseudocode in the department, I would say. Um, especially people like Teresa Migler, Christopher Sue, all those people. Uh, we all kind of have similar pseudocode. So hopefully getting comfortable with my pseudocode will be a good way of feeling comfortable with um, the pseudocode as you transition through the rest of your uh, journey in computer science. So. What are some things you can do with pseudocode? Well, you can assign values to variables. So what I have right here are two examples of this. You'll see that I use a left facing arrow instead of an equal sign to say, I'm giving y the value of five. Now, when I put light in front of here, this implies that this is initial value of y. Oh, and by the way, if you want to put comments in your pseudocode at all, you can actually use this uh, double slash method right here like I did. So two slashes is generally understood to be pseudocode comments. If you're trying to update the value of a variable, you don't have to say let. You can just say, in this case, x arrow x plus 1, or x gets the value of x plus 1, something like this. So let implies initial assignment. Uh, no let implies that you're updating the value so that it had a value beforehand. You're allowed to use operators. So any operator we've seen in this class so far, all the set operators like union, intersection, set minus, all that kind of stuff. Um, propositional operators, mathematical, op uh, I guess, numerical operators, all of those kinds of things. We're not going to see any of the programming language specific ones. So no equals equals, no plus equals, no plus plus minus equals, all of this kind of stuff. This, These are specifically for programming languages. Um, and they're not ones that you see outside of programming languages. And honestly, most of them aren't even seen universally among programming languages. So if you're in Python, you'll use and, or, or not, like actually spelled out as words. A lot of this stuff is in C notation. Um, MATLAB, if you, I don't know, probably none of you are going to use MATLAB and maybe that's for the best, but I've been teaching MATLAB and MATLAB really goes buck wild with some of its uh, operators. Uh, it uses tilde. It uses the tilde, the, um, the squiggly one, instead of an exclamation mark for not, which is the weirdest thing and also very annoying to have to explain to uh, students. But basically, mathematical operators good. 
computer science, or sorry, programming specific operators bad. We can have conditional statements. So stuff like if a condition then uh, block of code, or if condition then block of code, else do block of code, stuff like that. You can also do like an else if condition then sort of like that. This one is very similar to um, what program, how programming languages do if statements, except, you know, put, in the, put a then at the end so you know that you're starting the block of code. Also, indentation is pretty nice. And then there's, you can also do loops. Uh, here are just a few examples of how to structure loops. You can do uh, for something do, you know, this would be, you could use this for either a for each loop or a more traditional for loop. There is a while blank do, or a while condition blank, blah, while condition do block of code. You can also do a do block of code while condition, sort of like what uh, you might've seen in C in the past. The difference being is that this checks the condition before doing the block of code. This does the block of code before checking the condition. Um, honestly, please let me know if you ever have found a use for a do while loop in any real life coding. I have never been able to make a do while loop work. I've only been able to do while do, not do while. So please let me know. I am very curious if anyone has actually been able to make it work out because it always falls apart on me every time I do it. Regardless, uh, that's some basics of pseudocode. So let's take a look at some pseudocode for the max element problem. This is what I would consider good pseudocode. So we have algorithm max element of A. A is going to be the input, and max element is the name of this algorithm. Down here, I have an input statement and an output statement. And for full credit on all of your algorithms, you must have an input and an output statement. You must tell me what the algorithm is taking in and what it is outputting. And this is really important because it it's a really important step to tell the reader, hey, this is exactly what's going on with this algorithm. This is what the algorithm is taking in. This is what the algorithm is doing to that input. And uh, as you go on in the curriculum, this having an input and output statement like this, describing what the input and output are, is just going to be more and more important. Um, I believe Teresa is much more strict about this than I am, uh, especially if you get into her. Actually, she might not be. She's a, she's very nice. Um, but I cannot stress the importance of this enough. So you should always have an input and an output statement. So for this problem, I have said that the input A is a finite sequence of integers. Uh, and I've also described the elements that live in A. So I've given them names, A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, A sub 4, A sub 5, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through A sub n. The nice thing about the way that I've done this is that now if we talk about any A sub anything, we can assume that they're elements in max element. And we know that we know now that there are n elements in max element. Oh, sorry, there are n elements in our input. So we know that whenever I talk about n, that refers to the number of elements in our sequence. We also know here that all of the elements are integers and that n is actually a natural number uh, because the sequence is finite. So this is the power of a good input statement is we defined a whole lot of things, what the, uh, what the input looks like, how we can tell when we're talking about elements of our input and how large the input actually is. Now the output is a fancy way of saying that we return the largest element of max element, but oh, sorry, we return the largest element of A, but what I've done is I've mathematically defined what it means to be the largest element of A so that we, ha we know for certain these are the conditions that it must fulfill. So the output here is going to be some element X in our sequence a such that for all elements y in a x is greater than or equal to y so these are the two conditions that max element must fulfill in order to correctly return the output x so what i have here is i have a uh, i have an example um algorithm and you'll see that i numbered the lines of code this is going to be really important. You should always number your lines of code. And we'll, we'll talk about that when I actually show the proof of correctness for why this works. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to let 
max get the value of a sub one. So we're defining, we're doing an, an initial defi definition of max and we're saying that it has the value of a sub one, the first element in the list. Now I'm going to run a for loop. I'm going to give i initially the value of two and then I will just increment one by one by one until it reaches n. So for i from two to n do uh, and then for every value of i, it's going to check if a sub i is greater than max. And if it is greater than max, we just set max's value to a sub i. And then continue on with the loop. And then at the very end of this loop, we know that we have found the maximum value of our sequence. So we just return max. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write an equivalent Python code for this. So um, you'll see how similar it is. And actually, we can. I'll show you how we can go straight from this uh, algorithm to the Python code. So let's see. I'm going to say uh, define max element, which gets the list A. Remember, this is Python code, so it's relatively easy. Um, if we're going to say let max get the value of A sub 1, um, and by the way, going along with the fact that we don't have to error check in here, for now, I'm going to assume that A is a valid sequence. Um, if, the, if I was actually using this in a real life coding scenario, of course, I would want to check that A has, uh, it, that A is not empty, that um, A is finite, all that kind of stuff. I guess we can assume A is finite in a coding environment, but, you know, we'll assume that A is not empty and that A has only integers at the uh, at this point, we can maybe assume that we've already passed A into some sort of uh, validation function to make sure that it's good. So we'll define max element of A and then say, okay, the first line in here is just going to say max equals A, uh, sorry, A at element zero. Notice here how I started the indexing at one and I started indexing at zero here. doesn't really matter. Um, where if you start indexing at zero here, or if you want to index at one, either way is totally fine, whatever you're most comfortable with. If you're indexing at zero, then you'd want to stop at a sub n minus one if you want a list of n integers. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, so we have max equals the uh, zeroth element of a, and then we would say for i in uh, range to n, or I guess in this case, rather than n, it would be length of a that goes in there. What we're going to do here is we'll say if uh, a at element i is um, greater than max, then uh, max gets the value of a sub i. We'll just say max equals a at position i, and then we just return max at the end. So we'll return max. And look how easy it was for me to um, convert this from this pseudocode to this actual code like this. And you can, you can experiment. You can have fun with your favorite programming language and see how easy it is to go from this algorithm to programming this in your favorite programming language. However, this is all good. This is all well and good. But what I'm going to focus on is actually recursive algorithms. And the reason why is because recursive algorithms are going to be a lot easier to show that they are correct. So the rest of the algorithms in this class, we're going to be talking about recursive algorithms. So just bear that in mind. You're going to want to feel comfortable with recursive functions, which is something you should feel com uh I guess some of the skills that you built in 202, you should feel comfortable with those kinds of skills, how to do like recursive code, because recursive algorithms are going to work very similar. We're basically we're determining the output of a certain, uh, basically we're determining the output of a certain input by taking that input, knocking a piece off of that input, applying the uh, algorithm recursively to that smaller piece, and then using the results of that recursive application to figure out our new, um, figure out our value. So 
And what you're also going to want to be comfortable with is proof by induction, because we're going to be using a lot of proof by induction in order to show that our recursive algorithms are correct. And I will give you an example of that in just a moment. So here's a recursive algorithm for max element. Uh, same input and output. We let a be a finite sequence of integers, uh, a1, a2, all the way through a n. So it's a sequence of n integers uh, where a sub anything refers to an integer in that sequence. Uh, and our output is going to be exactly the same. It's the largest element x in a. Uh, this algorithm is a little bit shorter. Line 1 just says if n equals 1, then we'll return a sub 1. Otherwise, uh, we're going to return the maximum of a sub 1 and max element of a sub 2 all the way through a sub n. So we're making a new sequence here. This is a new sequence. And then we're doing the recursive call and comparing the largest element of this new sequence, which is basically just the rest of the elements. We compared the largest element of this with a sub 1. And if a sub 1 is greater than this largest element, we return a sub 1. Otherwise, we return this largest element. And that's how the recursive algorithm looks. And Again, we can uh, try to convert this into Python. So let's say we'll do def uh, max element with input a. And we're just going to very casually do um, if n equals 1. Uh, sorry. We're talking about Python. If n equals equals 1. Sometimes it, uh, the pseudocode and all the programming languages I have in my brain get mixed up. If n equals equals 1, then we'll return a at... Also, this shouldn't be n. My bad. This should be length a. If length of a is equal to 1, then we'll return the zeroth element of a. Else we'll uh, return max of um, a at element 0. And um, I guess in Python, we could say a of 1 colon, which is uh, the all of the remaining n minus 1 elements in a. So again, relatively easy conversion from the, uh, from the pseudocode to Python here. And if you try to do it, uh, do the conversion to C or Java or maybe even some of the more obscure, weird, funky programming languages, you shouldn't have too hard of a time. I mean, the fact that this is recursive, even if you if you like uh, languages like Racket or Clojure or any other um, any other functional language, then the conversion from a recursive algorithm to a uh, functional language uh, type of a functional language type of um, program, that becomes a lot easier. So recursive algorithms have a lot of benefits. OK, so we have a recursive algorithm, which is all well and good. But the most one of the most important things, and we talked about it on things that an algorithm must do, an algorithm must be correct. How do we know when an algorithm is correct? Well. In the case of max element, max element is correct if for our sequence A, it gives us out the largest value. So let's take a look at how we would show that max element is correct. I have right here the theorem, max element is correct. Cool. What a wonderful theorem. Super clear, super easy for us to solve. I'm kidding. This is a nightmare. So in order to solve the theorem, to show that the theorem max element is correct is true, we're going to need to rely on a lemma. And our lemma is basically going to specify what exactly we need to show in order to prove that max element is correct. So the lemma is actually going to be based off of the output statement of this, that uh, max element returns an x in a such that for all y in a, x is greater than or equal to y. So our lemma here says if the sequence a is equal to a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way through to a sub n, and max element of a equals x, then x is an element of a, 
and for all y for all i x is greater than or equal to a sub i so this is what we need to show and if we can show that this is true then we can say that this theorem is true is proven because directly as a result of this lemma so maybe take a moment and Try to make sure that you feel comfortable why this lemma shows that max element is correct. If you have any questions at this point, now would be a great time to ask them about, hey, why does this lemma show that the theorem is correct? How does this lemma prove that our theorem works? So hopefully at this point you feel, com you feel confident about the lemma statement. We're now going to do a proof by induction given that we have a recursive algorithm. So for the base case, the base case is really nice. Suppose we have an element of one, uh, sorry, a, a sequence with one element. Well, one element must be the largest element in that entire sequence. So we're just going to return that one element. But what I'm doing here is I'm actually explaining why I know that the algorithm returns a sub one. So for this proof, you might want to keep your notes, any notes that you took about the recursive definition for max element, you might want to keep those uh, nearby because I'll be referencing that algorithm in specific line numbers a lot in this proof. So what I'm going to show for the base case is why I know for certain that the algorithm is going to return a sub one. So that basically means going through the algorithm and saying, well, we know this information about A, so this is why the algorithm will behave like this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to suppose N equals one. This is just part of the base case. Then because N equals one, we have this check on line one of the recursive definition. And this check will be true because N equals one. So because that check passes, line two returns a sub one, which means that our x that is returned from max element, x is equal to a sub one. By the way that we defined a sub one up here, we know that x is now an element of a. And since a is basically equal to a sub one, let me try to make that a little bit clearer. a sub one is equal to a right here. Since we know that x is equal to the only element in the sequence, x must be the largest element of the sequence. So the base case is a pretty easy proof. We're just saying that line one, on line one, the if statement directs us down to line two. On line two, the, uh, the algorithm returns the only element in the entire sequence, which we happen to know is an element of the sequence and also is the largest element in the sequence more, more specifically. So that's how the base case works. The inductive hypothesis, all I need for this one is a weak inductive hypothesis. And the reason why, it comes from how we're, uh, how we're doing the recursive call here. You can see that the recursive call, all we do is we remove a sub one from the sequence and call max element on the next n minus one elements of the sequence. So we're actually, we know for sure that this recursion happens on n minus one elements. So all we need to do is make sure that we know that this recursion happens, that the recursion on n minus one elements works in order for us to say that it then works for n elements. So that's what we're doing right here. We're going to suppose that the statement holds that max element returns the largest element when it has k elements in it. And then the inductive step, we're going to show that it holds when it has k plus one elements. So we can note that k plus one is going to be greater than one. So that means the check on line one fails. We're not going to go to line two. Instead, we're going to go to line three. Now, what I've done here on line three, that's where we know we'll be making this recursive call. So I just set the output of this recursive call to be y. So we're saying let y be the output of this recursive call. And I'm going to note that there are k elements in this recursive call. Because there were k plus 1 elements up here, we removed a sub 1. I'll try to make this a little bit clearer that this is a sub 1. We removed a sub 1, and we just have a sub 2 all the way through to a sub k plus 1. So there are k elements in here, 
which means that by our inductive hypothesis, we assumed that the statement holds when A has K elements in it. So by that inductive hypothesis, um, we know that this result is correct. We know that Y is an element of A and that Y is larger than every other element of A. So basically what I'm saying is that for every A sub I, from A sub 2, A sub 3, A sub 4, all the way to A sub K plus 1, Y is greater than or equal to A sub I because we know that Y happens to be one of the elements in here. So in other words, Y is the largest element of the last K elements of our original sequence. Now you can ignore the chicken scratch there. Basically, what we have, uh, let me actually come here. What we have is we have two out outcomes. One is where A sub one is larger and one is where Y is larger. So what I did is I broke those into case into case statements. In the first case, a sub 1 is greater than or equal to y. And what that means is that the max of a sub 1 and y is just equal to a sub 1. Uh, I want to clarify that if a sub 1 is exactly equal to y, then it doesn't matter which one of these particular values max actually returns because both of the values are the same. So no matter what, we can just generalize and say that it returns a sub 1. Uh, so if max of a sub 1 and y equals a sub 1, then line 3 is line three is returning the maximum of those two. So line 3 just returns a sub 1. Uh, clearly, based on the way we defined a sub 1, which is that it's an element of a right here, we know that a sub 1 is going to be an element of a, and by this we'll know that it's larger than all other elements of a. Uh, in the second case, a is less than y. So what that means is that max of a sub 1 and y is going to be equal to y since y is larger. So line 3 just returns y. In either case, we know that a sub 1 and y are both elements of a, and they're both going to be, and uh, whichever one is the maximum is going to be larger than all other elements in a. So in either case, max element returns the largest value of a. And that's our proof. So that is an example of an algorithm and a proof that that algorithm is correct. Now we'll be going over more. I'll actually, in class, I'll go over another algorithm because I think it's really valuable for me to go over an algorithm in person. And that's simply because um, I want to make sure that I get actual uh, in-person feedback on how y'all feel. And one thing that's really important is I want to make sure that y'all get plenty of practice figuring out how lemmas like these work figuring out what these lemmas are, how we know when a solution to a problem is actually correct. So you can look forward to that in class. We'll be talking about uh, the search problem, how, we, how to find a specific element in a sequence. All right, well, that'll do it for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.